the mind of any sentient individual can expand beyond the limits of existent reality by an apparently limitless extent called the imagination. Just as the knowledge of any individual about the entirety of existent reality may be unique and finite, but may also be expanded upon, it is thought that what may exist in higher realities may be apprehended from this imaginary realm beyond all knowable and true reality. Thus, fantasies we may merely believe to be true may indeed prove to be as of yet hitherto undiscovered extensions to our mutual consensus known reality thus expanding its apparently outermost limiting boundary. Immediately upon contemplating the imaginary realm beyond the real, one will note the similarity of hyperspace surrounding space-time to the aura surrounding the living body or to the ionosphere of any magnetized orb in outer space, the Earth, the Sun, planets, moons, etc. Indeed, as the living body has a soul, so the heavenly bodies have EM fields, and just so does hyperspace surround the local universe. However, to theorize that the ionospheres of the local solar system imbue the planets and sun with egos or psyches or nascent minds of their own, and thus to go farther to compare the soul of the universe to the mind of God may be merely our own species selfish projections. The mind of any sentient individual can expand even past the layer of reality beyond the local universe called hyperspace. However, unlike our physical eyes, which only look out and cannot see themselves, the mind's eye can look within from this point of perhaps ultimate extension. If one expands their imagination to within or beyond the level of hyperspace and then looks down from above to below, one will see the same thing that has thus far only been modeled by computer simulation perceptible by our own physical eyes. That is, that the intergalactic plasma filaments resemble the neurons inside the frontal lobes of our own species' sentient brains. Again, this may prompt fools to claim the universe is equal to a single enormous sentient brain. However, the patterns in the heavens above preceded and preferred their mimicry in our own gray matter below not the other way around. And so it is as unlikely that the cosmos has a mind of its own, or ego, the universal God idea, as it is that our own local planets do. So we may say that, from the inside, looking outward, the intergalactic plasma filaments resemble the neurons inside any form of sufficiently evolved cerebrum. This tells us, firstly, nothing of the outward appearance of the cosmos if it were seen from the outside looking inward. It tells us, secondarily, that this cosmic cellular resemblance is due to our evolution mimicking the same tensegrity patterns that underlie all the natural physical laws of the universe, and not vice versa. 
And it tells us, thirdly, that we should not necessarily project anthropomorphism onto the exterior visage of the local universe, let alone the placement of such a meta-being's other internal organs. Because, to this third point, what the resemblance of the intergalactic plasma filaments to the neurons of the cerebrum implies is that the local universe is a giant brain inside, ostensibly, an unimaginably vast metaphysical skull forming the head of some multiversal cosmic meta-being of unfathomable scale whose other internal organs, each presumably nearly the same size as our own local universe, remain as ineffable to us within the brain as is the cellular functioning of our own lungs or heart or flesh to our own brain cells. Of course, the argument may be made, abandoning anthropomorphism, that such parallel dimensional realities may indeed exist although their relationship to our own is not yet fully disentangled by modern theoretical science. However, whether such a multiverse of parallel dimensional local universe sized metaforms exists or not remains irrelevant to proving the point of whether or not such a conglomeration of internal organs constitutes a living or even lifelike meta-being. After all, we still cannot even all agree when life begins for our own species about gestation of a zygote inside a womb. So it would be the height of human folly to assume a multiverse of parallel dimensional metaform internal organs are organized into any format that could be construed as a living body, let alone a sentient life form as such. Therefore, again, to say the universe is a brain, given that hyperspace resembles the aura containing the mind, and the intergalactic plasma filaments resemble neurons in a cerebrum, may imply a great many troubling questions modern science, unsure what constitutes life itself, is unprepared to answer. We are told in scripture that God created the universe, in so many words. To very many this may imply that the universe is within God, and therefore of God and is, more than merely an intellectual offspring, an actual appendage of God's physical being. However, whether the universe exists as an independent body apart from its creator deity, or else as an extension of or growth within it, either way, we are told that there is a God and there is the universe and that the former created the latter. To believe that the created cosmos may resemble its creator, God, because our brains resemble the cosmos, requires the leap of faith that a parent cosmos, greater than our own, would obey, essentially, the same or similar rules for maths and physics as our own. Thus it could be said they may resemble one another. The reason, after all, our brain cells can resemble the intergalactic filaments is because both share the same common medium of intangible rules and laws for math and physics as one another. The same cannot be said yet with assurance about the local universe and its parent cosmos. Furthermore, if we assume our local universe is a brain alongside other internal organs 
of a meta being that is alive or dead, its creator could still be simply natural causes due to the conditions of the parent cosmos itself, or it could be conceived as such by some actor or force within that parent cosmos, but not acting directly as an agent of that parent cosmos's universal laws. For example, God may have invented the universe, but this tells us nothing of the substance of God, nor the nature of his world. God and the universe may or may not have any resemblance to one another in the same way a man and his son, or a plant species and its clones, may or may not resemble one another. It may seem more likely to us that they would, but this may yet not be the case on a supercosmic scale. The beginning of wisdom may be fear of God, but the end of wisdom is knowing that none exists. We live, literally, on a speck of dust that will last, barely, the blink of a cosmic eye. Our sentience, let alone survival, is a miracle of statistical odds, but is nevertheless an inarguable fact. We can use this self-awareness to perceive the cosmos and learn its physical laws. Those who try to apply these observations to improving living conditions for the rest of us alive are true messiahs. But there is no universal mind such as our own, only much larger. The cosmos had no creator deity, and it does not need one to function as it does now. The idea of God is the projection of mankind's hubris writ infinitely large. Those that believe in it rely on it as merely a useful illusion, the product of mass hypnosis. But outside the purely metaphysical, there is no evidence whatsoever for the existence of any kind of God. There are many possible disproofs for the concept of a universal creator deity, but necessarily fewer possible proofs. The same is true of that other old world canard, Earth is flat. That voice in your head you call God is culturally cultivated schizophrenia at best, and closer to demonic possession and truth. Here's a little test you can do. Ask yourself the truth. Ask your God if you are psychic. If you are not, then how can you hear God? But if you are, then you can ask your God to define itself. This is similar to asking a robot to express an emotion. In short, it cannot logically compute. The six fundamental questions of ethical reasoning intrude. Why would the deity that created the cosmos be speaking to you personally? Where is this voice coming from? Whose voice actually is it? Etc. It is quite clear the belief in God, in any form, is madness at least, and unnecessary at best. Belief in morality may be easily divorced from belief in God, and without religion's monopoly on moral law, God is stripped bare and revealed to be the cause of all objective suffering and subjective evil. The problem of evil is only one, very arbitrary, disproof for this notion of omnitheism. However, as I have said, there will always be more disproofs for a false idea than proofs for it. All the belief in the world cannot make a false idea true. 
In truth, no universal creator deity exists because none needs to. Likewise, all those who pray to any higher power are just casting their willpower into the vast abyss of outer space, hoping they will bring back a showering of blessings from above. Fools have long made sacrifice to liars to improve their luck. Outside of those liars, selecting their loyal slaves from among the crowd of fools, has this ever truly worked for anyone's good? And what is God if not the ghost king over all liars and fools alike? Nothing more than a lie itself. That first noble lie that there must be one utmost being responsible for all reality dictates God as alike our own concept of a king. Ask yourself, has mankind prospered and progressed more with or without monarchy? Now ask yourself, and thereby be free of this noble lie of God, is your God's idea of good necessarily identical to everybody else's? Now you understand why evil exists. Because your God wills it so of me, and, for me, has deemed a life of suffering and a destiny of eternity in your imaginary idea of hell. Theism is a curse, a blot, on all our otherwise quartz-clear consciences and karmic auras. It comes between us and interferes in how we perceive and communicate with one another. To the extent your God and my God differ, we will naturally be enemies. To the extent we already agree, we must thus be friends. This is pure prejudice, and such preconceptions preclude the open-mindedness necessary to actually learn and grow. Of course, such behavioral traits are obvious. If two dogs share a similar pheromone odor, they will get along. Likewise, if two people's beliefs about God are more closely compatible, they will get along as well. This ultimately leads to the scapegoating by all theists of any atheist and blaming the atheist for all the sins and crimes of all the theists on behalf of their imaginary gods. The atheist does not share the theist superstition of the scapegoat, so this dog piling onto them by everyone might seem like a highly organized conspiracy. However, it is not. The only organizing principle necessary to cohesively link any theist, say a polytheist such as a Hindu, to any other, say a monotheist such as a Muslim, is their unifying hatred for someone who believes in no gods. To believe in no gods is blasphemy to theists of all stripes, because such a person is free while theists have voluntarily enslaved themselves. The atheist flaunts their liberty from the socially imposed norm of believing in a god, while the theist feels compelled by their own sense of righteous morality to continue to preach this lie. Theist evangelism brings delusional theism and logical atheism into collision. Supposedly, some roughly 450 to 500 million, 7% of 7 plus billion, people are atheists. 
To the extent atheism is the vastly minority opinion nowadays, it can be argued that 93% of the population are liars and bullies who falsely believe in God and scapegoat any who do not. These people believe their actions are always justified by their faith. They have not evolved one iota from the era of the savage, nomadic, Cro-Magnon of Stone Age Europe. All they understand is violence, pain, injury, suffering, and physical harm. Theists' experience of existence is, in this way, colored entirely over by their false faith in gods of any kind. The aura and conscience of an atheist is clear, but the aura and conscience of a theist will always remain stained and blurred, obscured and clouded by that lurking specter, that curse of theism that false belief that God exists. All these theists running around claiming gnosis to know that God exists or that God is this or God is that are deluding themselves. No amount of peak experiences be they randomly occurring produced by drugs etc., are miraculous enough to prove the idea of God is anything more than just a psychosomatic placebo. If we could know that God exists, then God would cease to be ineffable, and his plan could be comprehended by anyone through mere telepathic prayer. We could all talk to God, thus, and he would, at least be able to, not only listen to us, but also talk back to us as well. This is, clinically speaking, called schizophrenia. If you silence the voice of God inside your mind, you will realize it is merely an alien presence trying to manipulate you into egoless evangelism of its goals that, if you examine them closely, clearly run contrary to anyone's own individual goals for themselves. Here is a thought experiment to help you on your way. Imagine, instead of God, you substitute any other fictional character in its place, such as Moby Dick, or Scooby-Doo, or Sherlock Holmes. Then, when you hear people talking about God and his greatness, just substitute the other fictional character of your choice, and you will see the absurdity of the premise. Literally anything may be said about God and allowed by him to define the premise, except that God is false. Then, if you say that, you have made an enemy out of all of his brainwashed followers. No one likes to be lied to, so nothing is more difficult for people to accept than the fact that they have been lying to themselves. They would rather atheism be the lie, rather than a simple truth, and God be their savior, rather than their mental enslaver. If you disagree vehemently enough with all these points, please try to prove the existence of your God to me. I can only promise I will laugh at the idea's lack of logical validity, as I always do. None are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, author of Faust. God has a plan for each of us. It simply isn't the plan that we would choose for ourselves. God gave mankind free will. He created Adam, according to legend, and gave him the freedom to be able to choose to disobey. He set the forbidden fruit there in the garden with Adam and said, Don't eat this. Had God wanted, 
he would have created Adam unable to do so. But God gave Adam the free will to make a choice, and as soon as Adam chose to transgress God's imposed boundaries, God cursed Adam and exiled him from Eden. God created Adam flawed, with the potential for original sin already built in. Being all-knowing, God knew Adam would fall, as he had known Satan would rebel. According to the legends, God created Adam to tempt Satan into rebellion, then punished Satan by casting him down from heaven, whereupon Satan then tricked Eve into feeding Adam the forbidden fruit, resulting in God cursing Adam, Eve, and the snake Satan possessed. God is worse than dead. God is evil. The God prayed to and made sacrifice to, the God all believe in but none can prove, the God shared by all religions, yet agreed upon in form and feature by none. This God, even your own idea of God itself, is a phantom feeding off of emotional energies. God is to the minds of people like what the surface of a pond is to the fish beneath it. Beyond this limit, fish have no knowledge of the nature of those angelic birds that occasionally swoop down and abduct one from among their many competing schools. God is a bad idea, at best. In truth, the idea of God itself is the only way in which God exists, and yet this idea has, itself, grown so powerful and has taken up so much space inside the minds of so many many people over its history, that the idea itself has a mind of its own, a free will all of its own, its own plan, not only for itself, but for each of us as well. That a mental projection that has developed artificially intelligent awareness of itself has a plan for us all is, to most people, actually comforting. People have been conditioned to squander God's gift of free will on prayer and a life of cowardice and obedience to his covenants and commandments. Instead of thinking for themselves, most are happy being led blindly by their belief. If God is all-knowing and all-powerful, then his plan for our predetermined destinies is irrevocable, and his choices for our fate irrefutable by their very ineffably infallible divine nature. However, if God is not eternal, but merely immortal, and if God is not omnipresent, but present only in the minds of his believers, then God is not omnipotent and omniscient, but remains a deadly adversary down to the last psyche possessed by this foully demonic idea. This ghost king that rules the minds of us all, all his true believers, uses charismatic leadership, threatening propaganda, and untaxed voluntary extortion to train free people into fearful, obedient, angry, and sad fools. The most novel approach to dispelling theism is to instruct the aspirant toward divinity to pray and ask their deity directly if it is real or not. If the deity says that, yes, it is a real entity, then the nature of this reality may be addressed directly. But, if the deity responds in honesty and admits that, no, it is merely a hallucination, preserved as truth throughout history, 
then what about it is worthy of anyone's veneration or service? If the deity claims itself to be real, but cannot define its own nature, it will be revealed as like a spider spinning a web of lies. But if the deity is truthful and accepts its own nature as dependent on our belief in it for it to exist, then why would we choose to believe in it, since it refuses to mature beyond the psychology of an adolescent? Each sentient, when informed of theism, forms their own idea of God, their own definition for the idea, their own personally interpreted meaning for the definition. Everyone may have some general idea unanimously, even though no two specific definitions of this idea will ever be exactly identical. In an avalanche, as Voltaire quipped, no one snowflake ever feels responsible. So, everyone fashions their idea of God like a personal idol, a doll they carry on their back to do their thinking for them, to blame or thank for their own mental slavery's arbitrary rewards for obedience and punishments for free will. Even though no two of these God machines may ever be just the same, for truly no two people are ever one and the same, in genes and soul alike, still their sum fails to approach any explanation for their supposed inspiration. Even if added all together, all the different definitions for God people have personally must, necessarily, never be able to completely describe God, whether or not such an idea is even real. While it is impossible to admit that all ideas of God are necessarily true, it becomes increasingly impossible to deny that all ideas of God are probably false. In short, to some extent, no one definition of God can fully confine the concept. No two people will ever agree on it. Likewise, the entirety of all people's beliefs over all time about God are necessarily wrong if the idea itself is false in reality. If, that is, there truly is no such thing as a God by any definition. The myth of Lucifer, whom Christ, quoting Isaiah, compared to a comet. As the demiurge Yaldabaoth brands him as the original atheist. Lucifer, according to the legend, lost faith in God over God's creation of Adam. While God was tending to the Garden of Eden, Lucifer, according to the hypostasis of the Archons, ascended to the utmost pinnacle of his powers, seeking to supplant God on his throne, and declared himself superior to the universal creator. To this the entirety replied to him, You err, Samael. The epithet, Samael, meaning blind one. Thus is the moral of the story that any atheist should be distrusted by any theist as Luciferian and trying to set themselves up in place of God and to, in effect, try to play God themselves. This is, of course, untrue. Atheists are simply free from the delusion of theism, the belief in a false creator deity, be it of the universe, or mankind, or, preferably, of both. 
since no deity needs to exist a priori for the universe or mankind to exist a posteriori. It is unlikely one does. The great threat of atheism to theism is this breaking of the God spell, and thus why God's myths defend against it by associating this rebel angel with Satan, an adversary to God and to all good that God offers us and yet withholds. The moral is Lucifer in his impatience for results and power-mad hubris sought to overthrow God. But not all atheists are like this. The argument for monotheism runs simply. Without a king god over all others, the rest would fall to infighting, and the orderly kingdom of reality we know now would collapse into chaotic anarchy. The monotheist creator concept of deity, again be it of cosmos and or mankind, is taken to be the glue and mortar holding together the house of cards that is not only the fragile domesticity of humanity, but even the fabric of reality, the very law book of physics itself. Without this continued presence of the universe's external creator concept, the reasoning runs, the local cosmos would simply collapse into improbability and implode. This may be true. Enforced belief in monotheism has resulted in neoteny of the human genome, effectively stunting our development at a pre-adolescent level of responsibility by robbing us of our right to self-govern from early childhood on. As a result of this, people's natural abilities, particularly telepathy and manifestation, have been dulled down to the level of free will experienced by any hive-minded insect. People have become social drones. Due to this suppression, a violent uprising and revolt is expected to occur a psychic revolution. This scenario, in which people's own abilities are seized by their enemies and weaponized against themselves, would, it is predicted, destroy at least a large portion of local space-time. However, while the existence of such metaphysical concepts as a soul and telekinetic manifestation may be real. There remains no need for the existence of any form of creator deity. Evil people, through generations upon generations of inbreeding and plotting to rule the world, have gone unchecked in their plans to do so because there is no higher power to stand up to them and say, you err blind ones. Thus it falls to people to do it for ourselves and overthrow these evil people and thus to solve the problem of evil, how to fight it without becoming it ourselves. Once one has discovered for themselves the origins of the monotheist myths, Elohim being plural is only the tip of the iceberg. It is impossible to remain resigned to the false faith in a ghost god. The early church fathers of Rome co-opted the Jewish concept of Jehovah and promoted this fallen jinn trapped on earth back to the status of universal god as great Caesar's ghost the contemporary Hebrews had long believed he deserved. From Genesis onward, Jehovah is portrayed as 
increasingly an antagonist to mankind until the writing of the New Testament anointed Jesus, son of Jehovah, and Christ, son of the Catholic, literally Latin for universal, creator-deity concept. Then, the doctrine explains, all those who believe in Jesus will be saved as he died to redeem our sins. So the belief in a future coming world savior became the faith in a dead Messiah. Just so, the origins of Jehovah himself are equally incredible, as he derives from the air deity of pre-Persian Phoenicia, called later Ahura Mazda, that traces his origins, in turn, to Babylonian Asher, and thus to Sumerian Enlil. Moreover, Enlil had a brother, the mischievous Inki, who became Dagon, the fish god of the Philistines. Those sea peoples relocated by the Egyptian pharaohs following the eruption of Thera in Minoan Crete and moved to the shore of Judea we now call Gaza and, as the modern-day Muslims of Palestine, are the Arab Semite descendants of these Philistines. So, too, are the modern-day Jews of Israel, the Hebrew Semite descendants of the invading army that conquered the region following their exodus out of Egypt. The present war between the Muslim Palestinians and the Jewish Israelis was fomented originally, by the Catholic Papacy at the start of the First Crusade, 1096 to 1099, prior to which the indigenous Muslims and Jews of the Palestinian Holy Land were comfortably coexisting, but after which Catholicism portrayed Islam as a threat to itself while simultaneously exterminating countless European Jews in the Inquisition, banishing them from one nation, then chasing them into the next, leading to pogrom after pogrom, culminating most recently in the Holocaust. To renounce all your gods, all gods, and the God of all, are each different. It is easy enough to say to someone, I don't believe in your God. It is even tempting to some people to stand above a crowd and proclaim, I don't believe in any of your gods. But to not believe in anyone else's God leaves wide open a door to the possibility that one still believes in their own God. So one can safely say, damn all your gods, and merely mean them false idols, while still remaining true and honest to the idea of a one true god. Hence the lyrics by renowned Satanist Marilyn Manson, I never hated the one true god, but the god of the people I hated, seemingly absolves him of the ultimate sin, of outright atheism. It is somewhat more difficult to admit to someone that all gods are contrivances and merely imaginary superstitions anyway. The idea that more than one god can exist in a polytheist pantheon is already alien and abhorrent to much of Western civilization who strictly confused the philosopher Jesus with the metaphysical superhero, Christ, Son of God. So, for the Western businessman, the idea of Ganesh, the elephant god of Hinduism, is usually rejected as being not my god. 
So again, to say all gods are false leaves open the subtle back door to the agnostic option that my God alone is true. To say the many are evil doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as to say none are good. However, it is most difficult of all to admit to oneself that the idea of God itself is not just a bad idea, but that it is an alien mental virus that has infected the evolution of consciousness with the intention of stifling and staggering its natural rate of flow. The idea of the God of all, the Catholic or universal God, or even a God over all, the Hebrew universal creator deity ideal, is not just a faulty metaphor for describing a more complex reality. It is a purposeful misinterpretation and distortion of the truth in order to obfuscate it, confuse and mislead its believers. The very idea of a God in itself is a lie. It is difficult enough to have to fight off the limitless variations on my idea of God each person has. Ultimately, one can only ignore this mess if one wishes to proceed beyond it. Trying to fight it is a futile waste of time. People will lie, even to themselves, in infinite ways before they are prepared enough to accept the truth. To try to count each of our personal ideas of God, as in, this trait is my God's, that characteristic is your God's, is like counting the days when one is in prison for life. Everyone has a finite constellation of character attributes they would assign as the definition, for them, of God. Some call the idea a higher power, or even the most high ideal. In the past, ideas like an unmoved mover and an immortal ghost king have also been meant by the same word. The Hebrew god of the Torah identified himself to Moses on Mount Horeb as a jealous god although of whom the universal creator deity could have to be jealous, remains one of God's ineffable mysteries. In the end, all these adjectives describing each one of our personal ideas of God is irrelevant, since it is the idea in itself that is false. To this extent, though, this idea of God may yet merely be seen as like an abstract cloud of which everyone's interpretations are just unintentionally incomplete or intentionally inaccurate. But this is not the case in reality. God is not at all alike a cloud. God is neither like nor unlike anything or everything that can exist because it is believed God is all that was, is, and can be. And if God is all, then God would include God's own opposite, Satan, in a combination, equal, harmonious, or imbalanced, of good and evil. If God can be anything, even if opposites or in different places at once, then it stands to reason that God must be everything. However, if God is all things to all people, he must also be, like us, greater than the sum of his parts. Objective facts, in this case, are equal in value to subjective perceptions, and the truth considered greater than all these combined. But God is no more like truth, nor true in itself, 
than like a cloud, nor a cloud in itself. Any one individual truth is a philosophical comparison for God, like the particular item of a cloud, both of which are cancelled out by God's commonly definitive omnipresence. But the idea of God is not necessarily omnipresent nor ineffable, any more than it is true or a cloud. God is simply a wrong preconception, like taking a dead-end pathway in a maze and being forced to double back until you find the right track to take instead. The idea of God is false, and only this idea of God can be said to really exist, and no real God beyond it is actually there. It is not only one idea, or another, about God that is false. The core principle of the idea in itself is what is faulty. So to say God is a lie doesn't mean your idea of God or your own personal God or even any one given common God per se. It means that all people's ideas of God are lies because the core principle idea of God itself being real is a lie. So if God is not real is a true statement and the statement God is a false idea is also a logical axiom then everyone's personal idea of God not only your own is abolished equally. This, of course, is as unacceptable to all theists as it is fatal to their many personal gods.